Welcome to Crime Most French, a fortnightly podcast covering intriguing cases carried out on French soil. Researched and narrated by Cedric and rudely interrupted by me, Melanie. We're the true crime podcast on the lines. Crack open the van and let the mayhem commence. This is episode 69, The Henri Leon Schaeffer Affair. In 1902, a man is found murdered in the dentist's office. The affair will lead to the first arrest and conviction in the world based on fingerprints. I think that's possibly one of the worst places in the world to die. Whoever likes going to the dentist. Yes, that's true. On the morning of the 16th of October 1902, a man appears at the police station in the 8th district of Paris. Is eight, eighth must be quite fancy, is it? That's the... It used to be the richest, it's now the second. The 16th is more posh. But yeah, that's the northwest of Paris, that's the posh area. If, in general, the, the rule of thumb is the, the lower the, the number, the, the fancier it is. Yeah, because the more central it is, yes. the districts are arranged as a... A snail. A snail yes. pattern, so... Or so, and you work outwards, you don't... Yes. Uh, yeah. He's there to report that he found the body of his servant, Joseph Rebel, dead at his dentist's surgery when he arrived for work in the morning. So it's his servant... So he's the dentist. He's the, right. the guy who owns the surgery. And But why would he serve it? It's, it's somebody who's there who... But we'll see why his servant oh. was there. Right, okay. He thinks that Joseph was murdered. Mm-hmm. And the cops are a little bit surprised that he's so sure. But he explains that he has his servant a piece of cloth around his neck and that he thinks that was used to strangle him and also he's a doctor so he knows when he sees a dead body so he's more than just a he's more than just a barber he's a proper dentist he's a, whatever that means in 1902 i was gonna say he's, he's probably a <laughs> bit more than a barber but i don't know how much more but he's probably done dissections and he's probably seen dead people yeah I think this whole, um, you know, where would you want to travel back in time to? Never. I don't want to Never go back in time. I like my no. modern comforts, such yes. as modern dentistry. Thank you very much. Yep. He also says that his servant has marks on his face like he's been on a fight. Right, okay. So there's there's certainly evidence that he's not just, you know, coming up with some kind of cockamamie theory. He also offers the cops a motive. He thinks that the burglary was a motive for the the murder because he found cupboards and wardrobes and stuff that had been opened and searched through and all his stuff on the floor. So he thinks that someone was looking for something and his servant was there for some reason. Wait, wait, he thinks it's... A burglary gone wrong. He thinks that it's a burglary gone, gone wrong and we all know we've seen uh, major oh, yes. crimes. It's never. It's, ne- it's never, a, It's never ever a burglary gone wrong. Yes. Never. I've never seen a burglary gone wrong. He also reports that um, a large sum of money has disappeared and some valuable items are gone. Okay. The reason why he had lots of money is because it was 1902, people paid with cash. So people coming to his surgery would have paid him in cash and therefore he had quite a lot of, a lot of money around in his um, surgery. Yes. He didn't have like a touchless uh, credit card payment system. No, and at, at the time most people didn't even have a bank account. No. So they would keep money at home. Yeah, in their mattress. Yes, or in the walls, like in the case of my great-grandfather who found money in his walls when he renovated the family house one day. Oh, oh that's a nice surprise. That's a nice surprise. I don't know how much. My grandfather couldn't tell me how much it was because it was his grandfather. Okay. But yeah, my great grandfather, my great great grandfather, um, found um, some sum of money inside his walls. I see. Is that whose clock we have? Yes. Okay. So anyway, for the dentist, the servant surprised the burglar, the burglar, and there was a fight, and mm-hmm. he was killed, and he was strangled, and and all that. The cops go to the surgery to have a look. Mm-hmm. And you never know, they might, be, they might discover something interesting and they might solve the crime. There they discover a complete mess, as it was described to them. Mm-hmm. And Joseph is lying with his head on the chair, a piece of cloth around his neck and his body on the floor. His keys are next to him 
door keys. As if someone had gone through his pockets as well. Right. And dinner is ready in the next room in the kitchen. Oh, bummer. He didn't even get to have his yep. dinner. Yeah, apparently it was cheese, grapes, bottle of red wine. Just in case you wonder. Oh, well, that's just a dinner of kings, that is. Uh, could it be more archetypally cliched in French? Yeah. So uh, the number of dentistry tools are gone as well. There's vermilion decorations that are gone. that have been ripped up. They ripped off the walls. Who who would want to steal um, dentistry equipment? Mm, apart from another dentist, I have no idea. Oh, that's very weird. No clue. Yeah. Also, sixteen hundred francs are missing. That's a lot. Yeah. Um, I don't know what the sum really is because some newspapers say sixteen hundred and some add a zero. Say they say sixteen thousand. Oh, that's orders of magnitude bigger. So. Well, that's one order of magnitude bigger, and that would be, at the time, a lot of money. So yeah. I don't know which it is. Sixteen hundred is already quite a lot of money. Yeah. We're probably talking twenty thousand euros or something like that. Mm. But sixteen thousand francs would have been like fifty thousand. That would have been a shitload of money. Mm. I don't know which it is. But anyway, a lot of money has disappeared. Mm, yes. Only the safe which was locked, hasn't been open. So to the cop, yeah. He didn't have all that money in the safe. Nope, for some reason the money wasn't in the safe. What a tube. Yes. The usual routine for the dentist is to leave the office at about five. So he finishes early. Mm -hmm. And then Joseph stays until about seven to clean and put things away. You grim. Sometimes patients turn up after five. So he makes a note of who came. Yeah. And if that's the case, on his way home, he stops at the dentist's house and gives him the list of whoever came. Right. And then the uh-huh. dentist deals with it the next day or whatever. But some days nobody comes. And so he doesn't bother turning up. Exactly. So okay. for the dentist, it wasn't surprising that Joseph didn't come that Fair night enough. to Fair his enough. house. When the cops questions, question neighbours, especially the one below, um, she says that she didn't hear... Joseph's dog bark, because apparently his dog was in uh, surgery as well. No, right. So the dog knew. Which is strange. Yeah, exactly. That means that the the burglar, whoever it was, was uh, known to was the dog. Known to the dog. She heard muffled sounds at about half six, but didn't pay attention because uh, it's a dentist office. Yeah. Uh, there, there would have been no anesthetics. Anesthetic, and there would so have been a lot of noise. There would have been shouting mm. and screaming and whatever on a regular basis. So a few muffled sounds, eh, it's just normal. Yeah. Another neighbor, a servant who was looking after uh, her employer's third floor flat, mentions to the police that when she heard sounds the previous evening, she was on her way out. She was on the landing. And it scared her enough that she decided, I'm not going out, I'm going back in. <laughs> right, okay. Not something a genteel lady would want to hear. Exactly. So it must have been a bit more than muffled sounds. Yeah. So the downstairs la- neighbour must have been so used to the sounds that it's just background for her. So she just didn't pay attention. Didn't. Yeah, but wasn't the second woman on the landing? She was on the landing, So yes. the, the noise was probably a lot louder. Possibly, yes. The doors might have been sick. Yeah. Yeah, possible. So, yeah, the noises are not out of the ordinary. Um, also... It turns out when they questioned other neighbours that the relationship between the dentist and Joseph was a bit volatile. It varied between very, being very close and friendly and being violent. Apparently, Joseph used to drink quite a bit and once he even threw a bottle at his employer's head. He's got a patient boss. Yes. Yes. Another thing the police learns is that Joseph used to receive the visit of very, not very recommendable uh, individuals at the dentist office. So hours. not necessarily people who are looking for an appointment. Not people who are looking for an appointment, no. Right. Also, when they say not recommendable, they mean gay. Oh, I that see. Was code. Is that why they had such a volatile relationship, do we think? Don't know. Don't know. Strangely, on the dining table, there is also... Half a half drunk rum bottle with two glasses. So, oh, right, okay, I can see where this is going. So, to the cop, something else is clear. The robber was known yes. by Joseph. And no barking dog and two glasses. Yeah, yeah definitely. So, they had a drink and then something went wrong. Mm, yeah. So, the robbers decide that it's worth investigating. Mm-hmm. After all, the victim is fairly well off. So, white man gets police attention. Of course. 
still does. So they go to the dentist surgery again the next day with backup. Apparently four, four more cops turn up. An Amy, and for some reason Alphonse Bertillon, who is then in charge of the scientific police in Paris. And we've talked about Bertillon before. Um, he devised at the end of the 19th century, in the 1980, 1880s, a number of scientific methods to identify uh, bad guys, like photos of suspects, uh, faces, oh, the mugshots, the mugshots, but also fingerprints, measurements of various uh, features on the face and the body, even hand stigma. He created a, a catalogue of jobs and what, mark, what marks they leave on your hands. Oh, right, okay. So when they see people's hands, or when people report seeing things on people's hands, they can guess what job he has to yeah. reduce the number of suspects. Mm -hmm. So he, he's the guy who developed all these techniques, and he was the first in the world to do that. So he calls his methods anthropometry, which as his name, the name indicates is measurement of humans. Uh -huh. uh, but it's more, more known at the time as Bertillonage, <laughs> which is kind of um, derogatory probably comes from the cops because the cops were not too keen on it so the police at the time didn't like those methods so they they weren't really implemented they were it was just him doing it i mean that's just you can understand why they didn't like it because i mean it's offering a way of kind of like going against a uh, gut feeling which is generally how most cops probably worked back then yeah and cops don't like change still don't no so when you go to them and say, oh, I have these new techniques and you should use them. Yeah. The answer is, eh, no. no, I know how to do my job. Yeah. So, but of course, their, their murder um, solving rate was about 3%. So wow. really, essentially, if you murdered someone, it was very unlucky if you were caught. Mm. So at some point, the chief of police changes and the new one decides that could be interesting and there might be something in there. Okay. So he decides to put Petion's methods to the test for three months. And two months in, a serial criminal was caught using these methods. And from that point on, they were in, in implemented more widely. Mm -hmm. At the time, the reason why it was very important was because the vast majority of the crimes were committed by uh, people who were uh, serial criminals. Yeah. They were just doing it over and over mm -hmm. and over again. So the fact that you could identify someone and then later on identify them again yeah. was very important. Mm -hmm. So from that point on, it was uh, implemented. And by the end of the three months test, um, he had arrested 49 criminals. Wow. So good success rate then. It's much better than anything before that, I suspect. Mm -hmm. So back to the surgery. On the glass display cabinet, Bertie, you notice is on a broken panel, so a broken glass panel, a whole bunch of fingerprints. Having developed the fingerprint techniques, because it's not Murdoch that did it, did mm, it? Yes. he's intrigued. So he thought, eh, okay, I'll, I'll take that. So he takes the, the panel mm -hmm. with him and checks the prints when he gets to his office. He knew it could lead to the burglar, of course, if he was already in the system. That's a big if. Yeah. He... Himself, himself didn't like fingerprints. Even though he developed the technique, he didn't like it. Because to him, it was unreliable. Because it had been researched, I think, by um, a Canadian guy. And then the research was taken by an English guy. And then he picked up the research and made it some systematic system. Right. But he didn't like the fact that, according to him, it was a bit open to interpretation. So he didn't like it. He preferred by far the face measurements, for example, to, to identify people. Because to him, what was important is that you could distinguish between twins, for example. Whereas with fingerprints, you can't. Or you can't, yeah. So to him, measuring the face, like distance between the eyes and mm -hmm. the size of the ear and all that, because they are partly genetic, but also partly um, just acquired during your life. Yeah, and you you could make a distinction between people yes. who really look the same and possibly mm. have the same fingerprints. So he didn't like fingerprints, but he'd give, give it a try, a try anyway. Yeah, well, especially if you're doing that kind of thing by eye, you're not having the same kind of uh, success yeah. rate when you're using a computer. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So he also takes photos of the crime scene, and you can find them online if you want. He goes to the scientific police office with his panel and checks the fingerprints. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, the autopsy is done by the Amy, 
and it confirms the first observations that the victim was strangled, dead, right, and that his stomach is empty. So the Amy concludes that he was killed between six and half six the previous day, before dinner, obviously, because dinner was on the table. <laughs> but he was having a peril. Yeah, but that's as, that's as far as the Amy goes. It doesn't really have any more information than that. So it just confirms that what was completely obvious. The dentist was right with his uh, yeah. assumptions. As was usual at the time, the press hears about that story and they get involved. And we've seen many times at the time and still today that they don't mind making things up yeah. as long as it sells paper. So they're happy to run their own investigation between Air Bunnies. Le Petit Journal, which is one of the big newspapers at the time, even though it's called Petit, declares the next day that they have found evidence that Joseph uh, had friends in dodgy mm. years, I guess. Again, that's good. It doesn't tell the cops much that they didn't know, but they decide to go around the watering holes in the area because they know he had his habits over there. And they're not short of suspects, obviously, because that's where all the bad guys meet. That's especially true because some of those watering holes were known to harbor or homosexuals. So they were bad for two reasons. They were gangsters and gay. They even arrested a guy called Alfred. He tells the cops that he saw Joseph the previous night at about 6 p.m. when he went to the surgery to pick up his umbrella. Ella, Ella. Apparently he had forgotten his umbrella at the surgery before. So when he knocked at the door, Joseph opened, but refused to let him in because he already had someone there. So he tells the cop, the cops, it wasn't me, but there was somebody in the surgery with Joseph. So obviously he left. Yes, yes, yes. Well, I mean, that's the kind of like standard, oh, it wasn't me. Yes, there's someone else. There was someone else yes. there. Unfortunately for Alfred, he's a big liar. So he's... When he's pushed during an interrogation, he contradicts himself a few times and he's even caught in obvious lies. So the instructing judge has him arrested and thrown to jail. Right. He doesn't stay there very long because they have nothing to stick to stick to him anyway, but it probably cooled him down a little bit. Mm -hmm. He was a good suspect, but it's probably not him. As the police searches the dentist's surgery, looking for any clue of the identity of the murderer, they find a blood-stained cloth in the kitchen. Nothing too out of the ordinary for a dentist office. No. I'm guessing. I suspect the tools and uh, cloths and stuff are not disinfected every day. <laughs> no. They didn't really know about microbes at the time anyway, so... They also look for letters in the drawers, like, for example, death threats from people who were dissatisfied with their dentist. They can't find anything. No. I mean, really, who's going to be happy with their dentist at that uh, time? I mean, yeah, it doesn't exactly. matter how, how gentle you are, you're still going to be inflicting pain. Yes. What the cops discover, though, during the second visit, which they missed the first time, is that some variables weren't taken. So it's not what's important is not what was taken, it's what wasn't taken. Mm -hmm. So, for example, there's a gold watch in the office. Right. Obvious when you were enter the office. They think, what, what self-respecting burglar would go away leaving a gold watch that he can sell for quite a lot of money and fits in his pocket? They also find silver cutlery in the, in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. They find vari various other items that would be valuable, easily sold, but somehow still there. Right, so they're now suddenly thinking it's going to be a crime of passion. That's... Yeah, now they're thinking... Was it really a burglary? Yeah. Or is it, was it the burglar really stupid? Yeah. Or is it something else? Yeah, just like I said earlier, it's never a burglary gone wrong. Yeah. But apart from that, they have absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. They have no clue whatsoever who it could be. However, on the 29th of October, the cops announce that they know who the murderer is. <gasps> dun, dun, dun. Their evidence is so convincing that the judge delivers a warrant immediately wow. against a certain Henri Leon Schaeffer. He was born on the 4th of April, 1876, at Aubervilliers, so it's now suburbs of Paris. Um, he's 26 at the time. The police say that he has had various small jobs after his military service, and he disappeared on the day of the murder. That looks suspicious. 
but in a city of more than two million people, there would have been several people disappearing on that day. Mm. So not a huge clue. But what makes him stand out is that he knew the victim and he was one of those men within, with the, between the Arab bunnies. Because the word he, homosexual hadn't been invented? Um, well, they were using euphemism a lot at the of time. Of course they were. Um, and he had been seen at a dentist surgery a few times before mm. by witnesses. So to the cops, he was in the office the night of the murder. He was having dinner with Joseph. And somehow at the time, they would have decided to rob the dentist's office with Joseph's help. According to them, it's Joseph that had the idea to hide the robbery by making it look like an outside job. Mm -hmm. Hence the search of the office for things that right. they knew wasn't there, yeah. but mm -hmm. let's pretend somebody didn't know. And also the reason why some of the valuables were left behind, because a guy who comes in, robs the place, doesn't want to stay around for too long, doesn't yeah, want might. to spend too much time yes. searching. Mm -hmm. If you leave things, it doesn't matter. So that, to them, that was That made sense. Up. Yeah. However, the cops think that Schaefer got greedy mm. and decided not to share the loot I see. with Joseph. No honour amongst thieves, eh? Yeah. And also it makes things safer for, for Schaefer because yeah. one witness... You can't would, turn on. Exactly. If your witness is dead, he's not going to be able to turn on you. Exactly. Mm -hmm. There's no chance he's going to talk to the cops. Yeah. So to him, it would have made sense. Mm-hmm. So they declare to the cops, to the press, that they have the absolute proof that Schaeffer is involved in the murder, but that the information needs to be kept secret for now, just in case Schaeffer decides to deny his involvement during this trial. That's very intriguing. As you've guessed, the proof comes from Bertillon, obviously. Yeah, well, I guessed. When he came back from the crime scene, he extracted the fingerprints from the glass panel mm -hmm. that he took with him. And he found a thumb on one side and three fingers on the other side, like somebody handled the piece of glass. Oh, right. So, so both, both sides of both the glass. Both sides of the right, glass yeah. are prints. Of course, you can't see us actually physically no. doing that to each other, but <laughs> you just have to take our word for it. Yep. And he highlighted the prints with lead powder, mm -hmm. then photographed them, enlarged them, and then started to compare to the victim's prints. Yeah. They didn't match. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't. Uh, Joseph. So he therefore thought that it would be the murderer, most likely. Yes. And it took him a few days to come up with a name, which is insanely lucky when you think about it, because he was the only one using the technique. He mm. had just started doing it like a few years earlier. And somehow he managed to find a match. A uh, match by somebody hand. whose fingerprints he already had. Somebody, yeah, mm. exactly. Schaeffer had been arrested the previous year, for theft and breach of trust. That led to his anthropometric data being collected mm -hmm. by um, Bertillon and collected and, fi and filed. Right. Even though it was a first offence, and because it was a first offence, he didn't go to prison. Mm -hmm. He was essentially warned not to do it again. But somehow, at the time, Bertillon had decided to take his prints and his measurements anyway. I was very lucky. That's insanely lucky. So he describes in his, in his report exactly how he compared the prints. So he describes how he compared the location of the bumps, the lines, the intersections, the breaks in the lines and all that to show that it was exactly yeah. the same. Mm -hmm. And he says that he's absolutely certain that he can say that Schaefer was at the crime scene at the time because of the glass panel. Mm -hmm. You could argue that, yes, the print can show that Schaefer had been in the office at some point, but that doesn't show that he was there at the time of the murder. The link to the murder in that case would be a bit late, but Bertillon is certain that Schaefer's, Schaefer handled the glass after it had been broken. And therefore, because the glass wasn't broken before the burglary, mm. he must have been around he must between... Have been there time of the burglary yeah. and the time it was discovered the next day mm. and therefore he must have been there at the time of the burglary a few days later Schaefer enters the police station and declares that he's the person that the cops are looking for so he surrenders right the cops had a good description of who they were looking for and they're pretty sure that it's him so they arrest him 
He admits that he knew Joseph and that they were friends. Friends. <laughs> Everyone is again. And that's why he left town the next day, because he was distraught and he needed the break. But he totally denies that he killed him. The police, unknown to him, had intercepted a letter he sent to his mum. He had sent that letter for Marseille, so the other end of the country. And in that letter, he asks, asks her to send 40 francs to an address in Marseille under an, an alias. And he explains that he intends to, intends to flee to Argentina because he read in the press that the police was looking for him and that he was indeed linked to the dentist and his domestic. And he thought that they'd try to pin it on him, even though he was totally innocent, obviously. But oh, of course. They would accuse him and it would be a mess and he would risk prison. He also says that he had known the two people who actually robbed the place because he had talked to them before they went in. He actually sent them there, according to what he says to his mom. But he didn't do anything. All he did was tell those guys, oh, there's lots of interesting and valuable stuff up there. You can go and get it. And in Buenos Aires, he expects to start a new life. 40 francs is optimistic, but anyway. Maybe 40 that, francs goes very far in Buenos Aires. At the turn yeah, of but the at the time it would have been the equivalent of maybe 500 euros, so really, if you don't start a new life with 500 euros. But anyway, he mm. probably had a plan. I don't know what his plan was. After reading that letter, the Paris investigators called Marseille, and they called the police there, mm -hmm. and they asked them to keep an eye on Schiffer. So... As he was going back to his hotel one day, he spotted some cops. And that's what made him decide to play the system. So instead of run, and he knew he would get caught, he decided to surrender and try to use the system to get free again. Because remember, he's been arrested before and got free. Mm -hmm. So he's planning to do the same thing again. So he's arrested, sent to jail, even though he claims innocence. On the 2nd of November, in the judge's office, Schaeffer confesses to the murder, but he maintains that he only stole 250 francs in gold and banknotes. He lost some of it on the horses because he had a gambling problem, which is true, and he threw the rest into the sea when he learned that the police was looking for him. During the interrogation, he gives details of the affair. The dentist knew that his domestic was inviting men into his office. According to Schaefer, he even insisted to meet a lot of those men himself. In fact, the previous day, the dentist, Joseph and Schaefer, had drinks at a cafe nearby. Mm -hmm. And Schaefer and the dentist got along very well. But it's during those drinks that Schaefer and Joseph decided to rob the place and hide it as a break-in. Right. So that's when they decided to do it. The dentist was there. And the dentist was there and was listening to this. No, no, they, they, they were all having drinks. Yeah. And during that time, not okay. necessarily when the dentist was sitting next to them, but all the right. dentist was around. So they discussed it they discussed when he was it there, the but not listening. Yes. Okay. So he could have been talking to other people yes. or the men. Or he was a oh, man. <laughs> or, or, or something like that. Um, so he was in the cafe, he was around, he was mm -hmm. probably talking to them, but they were talking together as well. And that's when they decided mm, to, right. to rob the place. And it was indeed during the burglary that an argument broke out between Schaeffer and Joseph. And that's how Schaeffer ended up strangling Joseph with a towel. The dentist denies all this because it's not good for business to be known for... For being a homosexual. For being a homosexual, knowing criminals, harboring criminals and all that. Mm -hmm. But his assistant, he had an assistant as well, confirms that his employer was pretty gullible and that he strongly suspects that Joseph had already stolen stuff from the surgery and that the dentist never noticed, but he did. He's not a very good assistant if he didn't point it out. No, um, it could be that he didn't want to be accused of the theft as well. Okay. Because he also had access to the dentist. And True. Given that Joseph, at some point, at least had a fairly close relationship with the dentist. Maybe he thought, nah, he's going to choose Joseph over me. I'm not going to go get involved. Yeah, probably. So the trial starts on the 13th of March, 1903, in Paris. Schaeffer pleads 
homicide without premeditation to try to save his head. He says he never intended to kill Joseph, and it's only after the robbery that he killed Joseph after an argument. During the whole trial, the press repeats that Schaeffer and Joseph had despicable manners. <laughs> Again, a euphemism. Yes, despicable manners. And no doubt it had a, an impact on the trial as of well. Of course. Because then the, the victim and his murderer were both bad people. The jury find Schaeffer guilty, but not of premeditation, and therefore he's sentenced to life in prison. Uh, probably hard labor, I think. Okay. We know where that goes. Mm. No and thanks. too happy to have saved his head. Yes. He doesn't even appeal. It's like, okay. That's fine. That's it. That's it. I'm okay, okay I'm with that. I'm good with that. Okay. <laughs> and that's how the first criminal was arrested purely based on his fingerprints. And you have to think that uh, as they're still using the same method to gather fingerprints, if it's, uh, if it's uh, not broken, doesn't need fixed. 